Boston Celtics back on the floor getting ready for a game against the Brooklyn Nets. And I say it is a must-win game right out of the All-Star break. I'm going to explain right now on the Locked On Celtics podcast. Be ever ready. Recognize the city of champs. Boston, baby, we do what you can. Locked on number 18, Tatum and Brown, J team. Step back, we gon' wet that and slay teams. Of course, the Celtics, who else could it be? Screaming like KG with the Larry OB. Corrales above average, assessing the team status. Best daily pod, no cap, salary matching. Clutch like Bird to DJ, keep John on replay. Primetime, gapping up the truth on the sideline. Rain and Jays, how it started, raising banners, how we finished. Locked on Celtics, pod, home of the winners. B. Hey there, thank you for making Locked On Celtics part of your daily routine and your first listen every day. Locked On Celtics is free, available everywhere podcasts exist. It's on YouTube. Watch the show on YouTube. If you've missed any episodes, go to LockedOnCeltics.com. Scroll back. Every single episode is there in reverse chronological order. So very easy to find everything. I'm John Corrales. I cover the Boston Celtics for Boston Sports Journal. I've written a book called the Boston Celtics All-Time All-Stars. And I was a voter on the 75th anniversary team. If you missed yesterday's podcast, I had Jeff Twiss from the Celtics, Mark D'Amico from the Celtics, two of the men who spearheaded the 75th anniversary team. Uh, I thought that was an interesting podcast. So uh, you can check that out there. Today, I'm going to bring back my good friend, Tom Westerholm of Boston.com to discuss the Celtics being back on the floor here and Marcus Smart, Robert Williams. Let's start with that. Marcus Smart, Robert Williams. Is there any surprise here, Tom, that Marcus Smart's uh, ankle injury healed relatively quickly? I mean, I wouldn't say a surprise just because he he obviously had all that time off. And, I mean, you know, ankle injuries, like, they're finicky, right? Like, you never know. Um, I think hopefully he's, you know, making – Good decisions health wise. You want to make sure that ankle because ankle injuries can kind of hang around. I mean, anybody who's anybody who's played basketball, anybody who's sprained an ankle, anybody who's had that happen knows the uh, knows that crunchy feeling. It sure feels good. Um, so, hoping for smart, uh, hoping for smart sake that he's okay. But I mean, look, he had all that time off. You know, I'm, I'm sure he's had you know good advice on the topic. So I can't say I, I, I'm surprised. It's it's good to see though because, like I said. Ankle injuries can really hang around. I'm glad, I'm glad he's doing okay. I contend that the Celtics need to be whole to be any good. Um, I agree. And they could, they, they can maybe withstand um, Derek, Derek, you know, like Derek White can step in for Marcus Smart, but you still need Robert Williams. Like when they didn't have Marcus and Robert against the uh, Detroit Pistons, I thought that was too much of both ends not, not being there for them. Um, so having both back and, and obviously Rob feeling good and, and he said he rested his calf over the, the break and he seems like he's fine. That That is such a critical thing moving forward to me. Um, not Especially Rob. Like Rob has ascended to basically, I think, the third best player on this team. Yeah, I don't, I don't even think that's really a spicy take. Like that's just – um it's reasonable at this point I mean, very reasonable take <laughs> yeah like i think you know you can make cases for for other people you know you could you could talk about like you know smart's impact on the team and everything but i think you just from a tangible perspective i mean the it, it's because it's not just you know like the shot blocking it's not just you know it, it's also on the offensive end just that that added level of like almost unpredictability right where like if somebody drives into the lane you know if it's tatum if it's smart if it's jalen whoever it is you like they can either lay it up they can you know shoot a floater or they can throw it up to rob and when rob's not in there that eliminates one of the things that they can do and it just makes everything so much easier for the opposing defense so i mean he is i I think it's it's funny to say about a guy who's averaging like 10 points a game but i mean he is truly essential like if you know if the celtics the celtics need him tatum and brown healthy in the playoffs to kind of be what we think they might be able to be like you said i think Derek white gives you a little bit of insurance in case smart goes down vice versa. Also true. Like if Derek white goes down, you can kind of like makeshift things off the bench if you have to, but it is those three guys. I think you you just, you have no choice like that. Those are, those are the games that you might win when they're all in there. Yeah. I, I, I really think that Rob has ascended to a really high level and 
if he can just do a few more things as he gets older now, it was really funny in practice that he was like talking like he was 35, like he was Al Horford. And he's like, oh, yeah, the young guys. We can always count on the young guys to get us some energy and get us moving. We're like, what, what are you talking about young guys? Aren't you like 22? Like, well, how old are you? Um, these, but, guys all, these guys all internalized Kyrie just like ripping on the young guys during that one season. They're all like, oh, okay, that's what I did. <laughs> I mean, come on, Rob. I, he, he might be, and I don't know how the offseason is going to transpire and all of that stuff, but ultimately whenever the Celtics, let's assume that the Celtics in somewhere in this run do win a championship, Robert Williams might end up being the third best player on that championship team by, you know, just by virtue of not only all the things that he can do, but just the improvements that he can make. He's still getting a lot better defensively, offensively, uh, putting just not just putting the pressure on the rim. Give him uh, just a tiny bit of actual like offense. Like let him learn how to drop step up fake up and under or something. Give him a little baby hook in the post and and give him a little bit more time to work on his body a little bit and do it the right way and he can really be super super valuable moving forward i had people asking me on my boston sports journal like oh he's not he, he's hurt a little too much still like would would you want to get rid of him for somebody who's maybe not as good but more consistent i'm like what are you no 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 rob is has become one of the most important players on this team. And you saw it like in that in that Pistons loss, that last second shot that Jalen took, that was that was a shot that either because Rob was there wouldn't have been challenged by two people, or would have just been a lob. Like in, in the in the win over Philly or, or pick, actually picking game. How many times have we seen in that in that streak Jalen driving and then drawing some some defense and then whoop and Jalen used to be the worst alley oop thrower, and now he's just like, just nice touch there for for Rob. Uh, so I, I would say that Rob more than even more than Smart now has has made himself kind of indispensable, and his style meshes with exactly what what the Jays need, and he's he's like untouchable to me moving forward. Jalen is uh, was the second worst lob thrower. The first wor- worst lob thrower we all know was Terry Rozier at the time. He oh was, yeah, 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 he was yeah. Sorry, truly the worst Terry lob thrower. And he has a for that, but good lord, he was awful. Um, yeah, no, I, I think your point about about Rob like meshing perfectly with the Jays, like it, it that's that's a huge part of it, right? He's so low usage, like he doesn't require touches. You. You know, you mentioned him like working on a post-up game and like, sure, like that could be good. But I think a big part of the value of him is just he's, I mean, like he's almost egoless. Like, I mean, I, I mean, I don't, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't know that to be true. Like I haven't conversed with him about being egoless, but like you just don't see any pouting. Uh, like I, I, I've not seen Rob Williams pout once. Like I've seen pretty much everybody on the Celtics, I feel like, pout to an extent. I've never seen – he doesn't even argue with the refs, really. Like, he is <laughs> like, he, he is like really important to this team in a lot of ways. I think it's interesting when you start talking about, like, how kind of indispensable he is to the team. Like, you know, you, you kind of go through the list of guys who might be disgruntled, right? Like, because it's the Celtics, so everybody likes to talk about, like, who are they going to target, who are they going to go after in the offseason, and it's like, well, okay – if, if we assume that they are keeping Jalen and Jason together, then the only, you know, the guy who I think other teams would probably demand is Rob Williams. And I feel like if, you know, when you start that conversation, you probably don't want to be trading Rob for like another wing because he adds such an important dimension as a center. So it's like, okay, like Carl Anthony Towns, like what kinds of players are you talking about? But if you talk about Carl Anthony Towns, you're talking about a guy who is higher usage who kind of has a similar skill set to Jalen and Jason in that he sort of works from the outside in. And I know he's like a pick and pop player, so that's a little different. But regardless, like Rob is so unique and so low maintenance, low usage, just like happy to do his job and so quietly good at doing his job um, until he's really loud with his dunks that I think it, it, it's, it's very hard for me to sort of see – the avenue by which the Celtics are like, ah, maybe we will trade this guy. Like he's really important to this team. He really is. And as, as I try to fix 
issues with my my, my video here. Um, he is super important to this team. He's going to be super important for the Celtics if they are going to beat the Brooklyn Nets, which I, at the top of the show, said is a must-win game. Tom Wester, I'll get your take. I'll explain what I mean after I come back and talk to you about... Uh, first, I got to talk to you about Bet Online, which we know that football is done, which is people like, love to bet on football, but basketball back tomorrow pro college uh so for all the latest odds totals player performance props where the next fire coach is going to land scores podcasts news everything's at betonline.net it's the best spot for all of that stuff and it's not just basketball it's hockey boxing ufc odds everything that you can think of right there at betonline.net so head on over to the website use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action bet online where the game starts Please gamble responsibly. Hey, with basketball back, Locked On Now would be a great second listen for you. I know you've made Locked On Celtics your first listen. Locked On Now is a great recap of the night in the NBA. Each host records a couple minutes reaction to the games. You get both sides. So you want to get caught up on the game quickly, caught up on the league quickly, check out Locked On Now. Wherever you get your podcast, it's on the Locked On NBA YouTube channel. Bring Tom Westerholm back in here. Uh, I contend, Tom, that this Nets game is a must-win. Now, without my explanation, you must be thinking, John, you're crazy, right? A little, a little bit. I'm not. I don't think you're crazy. I think you're building to something, so I'm ready to hear it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so here, here it is. The 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 New York City is going to at some point ease the restrictions to and, and part of that is going to allow Kyrie Irving back. So you've got the specter of Kevin Durant coming back at some point in the near future, Ben Simmons playing somewhere in the near future, Kyrie Irving playing full time somewhere in the next few weeks. Um, and so the, the, I think the idea of the Brooklyn Nets coming together and becoming dangerous later makes wins over them now super, super important because I think the Nets have the possibility of going on a run. So first, first reason why must win to me, just put more space between them. It'd be two wins over them so far this season, two to one. So that guarantees at least they're going into a tie. The next tiebreaker after that is division winner, which I don't think either of these teams is going to pass Philadelphia. So you go to the next one, which is division record. Celtics have played much, much more in division. Celtics are seven and six in division. Brooklyn is seven and two. Brooklyn, six of their next nine opponents are in division. So this game, beating them here, not only – forces no worse than a tie if they and if, and if they win on march what is it sixth then they just win outright they win the tiebreaker outright if they win this game they now add a loss to the division record on top of everything for brooklyn so the Celtics would go to eight and six brooklyn would go to seven and three and then brooklyn has all of these upcoming division games that theoretically, hopefully for the Celtics, will come before Kevin Durant, before Simmons, before Kyrie come back. So that could be a huge swing. This could actually be a huge swing game should the Nets get everybody healthy and like go on a an eight-game winning streak to end the season or something like that where, where there's some jockeying for position and the Celtics need a tiebreaker to – Maybe avoid the play-ins, you know, tournament or something like that. So I think I think this win has presented itself as a bit of a must-win. Yeah, I like that take, and I think you know, especially you look at just how quickly the Celtics reversed their fortunes, right? Like it did not take long for the Celtics to go from, I mean, you know, it, it took a it took a heck of a of a winning streak, but realistically, you know, you could you could see the Nets doing pretty much the same thing at some point. And especially like 
the, I think to your point about this kind of being a, a turning point type game for like the Celtics Nets in particular, we are 60 games into the season, which is kind yeah. of wild when you think about, you yeah. know, the all-star break feels like halfway and it's just not even close. Like it is so far on the other end of the spectrum. Like the Celtics win this one. I mean, that's, you know, like obviously you've got 22 games left. You win this one, you got 21 games left. That is not that many games, and that's a pretty significant margin for the Nets to make up. So I think that's—I actually think that's a very reasonable take, if only because you know, like, the, like, like you said, these guys are probably coming back soon. There's going to be a little bit of a work-in period with Ben Simmons. I think that Ben Simmons is probably going to fit this team pretty well. Uh, you know, you, you could. Could, defensively, he's—I think he's going to add a lot. There's there's guys on this team, especially if New York City lifts its vaccine mandate. There's guys on this team who can really, you know, make up the difference for what he can't do. Like this Nets team could be tough down the stretch, especially if they can kind of work things together quickly. Um, so I, I think it's a good take, honestly. Um, this is you know wh- wh- whether you want to call it a must win or just a really important game or whatever it is. This is I mean th- this is a win that you should have that you absolutely no excuses should have. Um, and, and that, that would do a lot of good for you if you're the Celtics. I'll throw one more reason why I I, I, I don't think it's a must win necessarily in the sense that the, the reasons that I was telling you, but a, a, a win I'd really like to see is because of the way they lost to Detroit and yeah. how that brought out a lot of everything. Oh, we saw this again. Oh, this again. Oh, I, I would like to see the Celtics kind of just come out in that first game and be like, oh, no, that was an aberration. I feel yeah. like what that Detroit game showed us was whenever things are going wrong for the Celtics, that's just how it's going to look like. Like that, putting that game into the context of everything and the winning streak and how much has gone wrong for the Celtics for the past few seasons, it really feels like, like, oh, you know what? Maybe that's just not who the Celtics are. But when things are going poorly, this is just the style that you're going to see. And when things are going well and they're playing well, obviously they're gonna, it's going to be different. So I'd like to see the style of the winning streak, you know, pitch aheads and ball movement and that tenacious defense and, and really like going on these 20 to two runs and things like that. I don't think, what did they start the last game at 28 and two or 28 to two run, 26 to two run, something like that. Don't expect that again, but um, to come out and and be kind of decisive right away would be like, okay, that would really just hammer home, okay, that Detroit thing was, I think, just the trap game and done. I think especially because Jalen warned against the trap game. That's why that game, like, we didn't really talk about it on the pod. Like, Jalen was like, nope, we're trying to finish out this before the All-Star break. We want to, we want to rattle them all off. We want to win yeah. those 10. Like that was like, especially while you're like, they lose that game. You're just like, I mean, I'm not going to get out on you for it. You just won nine in a row. I get it. Back to back, all that stuff. I get it. But hmm, you lost that one. Yeah. That was, you know, it's not great. So I think, I think you're right. I think that's a, I think that's a really, if anything, honestly, man, I think that's bigger than all the other stuff you said, because sure. they do have a bit of a gap between themselves and the nets. Like even if they lose this one, I, which, well, okay. If they lose this one, then we get into, you know, the, whoa, boy, that Detroit game meant a lot. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, like the, the, the gap between them and the Nets is not is not insignificant at this point. You know, they they have been playing well. I think just like that, like showing like, okay, this is still a team now that has figured things out and takes care of the bad teams. That nine-game winning streak wasn't just a result of, of a random stretch of good vibes. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not all like the, the momentum isn't broken or anything like that. That's really important. So I, I think I think that's a really good point. I think the other thing to keep in mind too is like the Celtics have a pretty tough strength of schedule coming up here. They're um, according to uh, according to Tankathon, you know, their strength of schedule is tenth. Um, you know, Tankathon does it by um, combined winning percentage for all their opponents. You look at some of the teams that are ahead. They got the Warriors. They got the Grizzlies twice. They got the Jazz. They got the Bucks. They got the Heat. They got the Bulls. There's a lot of good teams on their schedule. Even the bad teams, you know, that are still on their schedule. You know, you got like OKC hasn't been playing that bad recently. I think they've right. won, um, you know, a few out of their last ten. You know, they've got Atlanta is one of the teams with like a lower winning percentage. Like Atlanta's no pushover. Like there's some, 
there's some decent teams still on their schedule. And, and like, yeah, you get a gift like the Brooklyn Nets without every single one of their good players. You, you better win that game. Yeah. So, yeah. I think it's I think it's all of those things um, that, that really comes back to it. I also wanted to point out I, I thought it was funny. You know, you mentioned the tenacious defense. I thought it was interesting that Ime kind of admitted he's like, yeah, like I think our guys sort of uh, um, sort of figured out that like good offense starts with good defense, and actually it's it's like the opportunity to have good offense that's been helping our defense along over this last stretch. He kind of kind of hinted at that today after practice. So that was. Just a random aside that I wanted to say because I thought it was kind of funny. Just a little bit of that carrot dangling, like, okay, if we're gonna if we're gonna score our points, we gotta yeah. play defense. You gotta uh, you gotta eat your veggies, and then you can have your buckets for dessert. That's right. That's right. Um, it's funny that he said that because the opposite, like, the, I feel like they should have learned that lesson already. Yeah. Because how many t- how many times has has it been like, well, the bad offense led to bad defense, and then that that spiraled and blah blah blah, like. I don't know, man. Like playing defense, get out, get some layups, man. The pad, pad your stats, pad your stats. Like that to me, it makes total sense. But I don't know, man. I, I, I've really over the past, I don't know why over the past few days I've been thinking about it. Like I, I just NBA players aren't just better at basketball than ninety nine and a half percent of the world. I don't think they think things the way we think things about basketball because they're all just, they've been so good for so long that they just, they've always been able to just say, Oh, well I'm better than everybody. So I can just do this since they were like, I don't know, like nine or 10, probably, you know, playing sixth grade and, and, you know, torching freshmen in high school or whatever. They're like I've always my entire life been able to just be like, oh, okay, no problem. We're we're in a, we're stuck. No problem. I got this. And like getting to the NBA when it's like, okay, I got this, and and it's just a league full of everybody who's got this. It, all of a sudden, it's like, what? What do you mean it, it doesn't work? This what? And it, I think it takes like the a, a little bit of humbling somehow. For them to be like, oh, well, okay, I guess I guess we're gonna do something different, because you're not you're not the best player on the planet or, or wherever your planet is anymore. So. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, and it's probably a lesson that rookies have to learn, right? Like like rookies have to like like that. That's probably one of the big um, learning curves that you have coming into the league. Is just like all this time, you know, like you're. Uh, I mean, just, you know, you're Romeo Langford and you've been the man every single place you've gone and you were kind of the man at Indiana. And it's like, you know, even there where like guys are as almost as good as you, um, you know, even there, you can pretty much do whatever you want because you're the highly touted guy coming in and you come into the NBA and it is just like you, like you said, it is the first time that all of this has been presented to you in a different light. Those of us who live on the mortal plane of Mm -hmm. basketball, uh, like, we have had to like kind of get used to the fact that like, okay, sometimes I'm hot and it's okay if I take this shot and sometimes I'm not and I need to chill out. Yeah. And it's like, you guys have never had to chill out. Like they've always just been killing people. So yeah. 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 You know, fans will sit there and be like, when it's not working, you pass the ball, you give it up, you let somebody else take the shot. And they're like, no, 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 hold on. I got this. I, I, I got this. I got <laughs> no, no, no. it. When, uh, when it's not working, you pass the ball because you're a bum at LA Fitness. Romeo Lake. <laughs> <laughs> Romeo Lake. When when I'm I'm right. <laughs> right. All right. Let's uh, let's come back and look ahead to the, the remaining schedule, at least the, the, the little bit right in front of us, to see uh, where do we think these guys – might land in the at least immediate future in these next few weeks. First, let me talk to you about Rock Auto, which is the place to go for anything you need for your car or truck or motorcycle or RV or whatever, because they will be able to give you a great price, a better price than the chain stores or a car dealership. Why are you gonna spend 30 to 50 to even 100% more at one of those places? Why are you gonna go to a chain store or one of those strip malls that's obviously a little very tiny place that no possible way has all of the parts for all of the cars that are out there driving around. Why Why would you expect to walk in there and get the exact thing that you're looking for? It's impossible for them to cover up, to, to have all that stuff. So you go to Rock Auto, which is a family business that's been doing this for over 20 years. They've got an expansive 
catalog that you can go through. No matter how complicated, do you know what you're looking at when you pop the hood? Great, if you do, then you can order that, whatever you're looking for, from Rock Auto. If you're like me, I'm very confused when I open the hood. I just trust that it's all gonna work when I push the button to start my car. And, but when I need wipers, I can do wipers, I can do headlights, I can do floor mats. That's all at rockauto.com too, and all at great prices. You can check different tiers to fit whatever budget that you have. So go check it out. When you do buy something, go write locked on in their how did you hear about us box. That's how they know we sent you. That's the only way they know we sent you. So very important that you write locked on in that how did you hear about us box. It's an amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. So Tom, Brooklyn, Detroit, revenge game against Detroit. Re <laughs> uh, Brooklyn, Detroit, Indiana is the upcoming road trip. Uh, and then you come home for Atlanta, Memphis, Brooklyn. That's the next six games. Is, is it fair to say that assuming that there's no, you know, assuming that nothing major happens, I would say this is an opportunity to go maybe five and one. And you just say, hey, Memphis, Memphis might be playing at just enough of a different speed where that's going to be a fascinating game for that Memphis offense and against Boston's defense and, and what that's going to what that could mean. I think the Celtics should whip off four straight wins and if that that next Brooklyn game on March 6th, assuming that there's – I just don't think they're going to be whole. Even if you have Kyrie and even if they all play, it's just going to be a little janky. I still think they can win that game. I think they could go – and hell, let's throw in Charlotte on the road in Detroit. That's – what's that, 5-1, and 6-1, and 7? There's another potential here for them to, to whip off another huge streak or a big stretch of wins there. I would even say – I would be very disappointed if they don't. I think, yeah, and I think to your point about Memphis, it, I think you you kind of treat that game as like if you if you slip up against Atlanta, come back and beat Memphis. You know what yes. I mean? Like show us that you can that you can rebound again, right? Like because nobody's expecting the Celtics to win. Nobody's expecting the Celtics to win six in a row, right? Like that's just like that. That's a crazy thing to expect, especially after a nine game winning streak, right? Like like nobody's expecting that, but. Yeah, I mean, trip against Atlanta, you know, maybe third, you know, third road game in, you know, in, in a row. Maybe you just like throw a stinker against one of these bad teams that you're that you're playing. Fine, as long as you come back and you like, you know, show that you can beat a good team. Because that was like the big question about the Celtics, and then they they did during their nine game streak. They showed they could beat you know the Sixers and obviously, um, you know, they, they, a couple a couple other decent teams. But like. That that Memphis game is is really a test, and I, I think it's going to be a really fun one. And yeah, if you've won four in a row and you lose a close game to the Grizzlies, but you show like, hey, these are some of the things that you know that we can do against the when we when we get to the playoffs. Like, fine, I think that's very reasonable. But yeah, this needs to be a really good stretch because after this stretch, it gets a lot harder. You know that like they were number ten on their on their winning percentage after yeah. these first three games. That winning percentage of the of your remaining opponents is skyrocketing because absolutely you, know, you 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 lose uh you lose an Indiana uh you lose Indiana Detroit off your schedule uh the rest of the teams are are gonna have better records than that for sure yeah I mean if you're fully healthy and you lose to Detroit or Indiana um then you're you're I would say even Brooklyn with however you know, there's no way they're gonna have everybody there. The, you treat Brooklyn like one of these bad teams. That's You have to sweep this road trip. You have to. Come back. Okay, Atlanta, I'll give you – there's the potential for Atlanta to be uh, a tough one because they're still, despite their record, they're they're underperforming. And there's there's still a chance that they can snap something and put it. I don't, I don't expect it. But, but after that week and after we get into that following game, that, that – Dallas game, which is March 13th. Is, that's the Kevin Garnett number retirement. Please don't have another number retirement where you just get embarrassed at home and people have to like pretend like, the, you know, 
emotions, whatever afterwards with KG. Like, I, I don't want to see that. And you know, KG is going to say something about that when he's, when he speaks, but Dallas golden state, that, that West coast trip, Sacramento, Denver, OKC, then Utah, Minnesota, Toronto, Miami, though, the rest of the month of March is, is going to be tough. And you even take that into April. You still got, you finish with Chicago, Milwaukee, and Memphis. And still the potential for jockeying for position. So that might not be rest your stars, Chicago, Milwaukee. Uh, maybe for Memphis it will be. But I don't know. That, that last, they finished they finish the, the, the season with a tough stretch. Let me ask you this question. We'll make this the last question of the podcast. Is it better or worse for the Celtics to finish the season with a stretch against tough opponents versus coasting through a schedule like the nine games that they just had to end the season? I think it's I think it's better for two reasons. Um, number one, you know, you can talk about like kind of ramping up for the playoffs. Number two, this this gives you an opportunity, right? Like this gives you an opportunity to kind of see where things where things are at once you enter that stretch of really good teams. If, you know, if you've kind of moved yourself, if you've taken care of business, if you go five and one over these next six games, there's a good chance that you've put yourself high enough above the play in game that you're like you're sitting kind of pretty. And, you know, I mean, maybe maybe some teams have put a little bit of distance between themselves, you know, or maybe like some of the gaps between the Celtics and the number three seed um, have stayed roughly the same. Right. Like you just have a better picture of things after, I think, the next like six games or so. And that can tell you like, OK, maybe, you know, a game against a good team is a game the Celtics are willing to just kind of sacrifice and they let everybody get a couple of, you know, get some rest, lose a game, whatever. It doesn't matter that much because they already know they're out of the playing game but not going to climb that high in the standings. Like, I just think giving like kind of winning some games here and just kind of knowing where you're at with 11, 12, 13 games left in the season and knowing kind of how hard to go, whether you're ramping up, whether you're like competing to try to maybe get home court advantage or whether you're just like, okay, screw it. You know, there's, there's no danger of being eliminated from the playoffs by a play in game. Um, as, as long as you're out of that danger, then, then you're good to go. I just, I, I think that like, a little bit of uh, a little bit of security in where you're at matters um, probably quite a bit for a team that really needs to be fully healthy entering the postseason. Yeah, I think I think it's good for them too because it does force them to like say, okay, we've got to work hard to to beat these teams. And you don't want to you don't want like the analogy I've made in a past podcast where you you don't want to be going up against junk ballers and, and right before you get into the, the playoffs and have that first game in the playoffs being like, whoa, what happened to this? That 90 mile an hour fastball just flew right by me. You want some of these tough games to, yeah, to test yourself, and you want to, you want, you want to have to work hard to to win some of these games. So, so I think I think that's actually not a bad thing for them. They are 34 and 26 with 22 games left, and among these games, you now have so we've got Memphis. These are good teams, Memphis. Uh, are we counting Charlotte as a good team? Sure. Yeah. Okay. You could lose, you could lose a game to Charlotte. They're good. Okay. To Charlotte, Dallas, Golden State, Denver. That's five. Utah is six. Well, Minnesota. Yeah. Seven. Yeah. Look, look, the Celtics have to treat Minnesota as a good team because they yeah. couldn't beat their JV team earlier this year. So yeah. Right. You better. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Eight is Miami. Nine Chicago, ten Milwaukee, eleven Memphis. So you got eleven games there against good teams. Can they split those games? Can they can they go can they go six and five or five and six against those teams? You go five and six against those teams. Then you finish, and if you beat the, the bad teams, you beat the bad teams. And you split against the good teams. You get six more losses. The set the Celtics will finish with 32 losses, which makes them a 50 win team. Mm. A 50 win team is not out of the question. Imagine and it's that's legit. Like yep. 
beat beat the the rest of the bad teams, just beat the bad teams and go 5 and 6 against the good teams. Not even a winning record, just go 5 and 6 against the rest of the good teams. And you're a 51 team. Yeah. A team that we were talking about breaking up, a team that was just the absolute worst. I can't believe that these guys there's a 50 win team in here. That's I, wild to me. That is wild. And I got a shout out to my man, Sam Sheehan, uh, who has been like in my DMs on my pot, like, you know, all like just all, all year. Like, I think this is a 48 win team. And I, I thought he was crazy for a long time. Um, but look, it's, I mean, 48 is like, that's like, that's very reasonable. 48 like, is very reasonable. Like 50s, 50s in play. You put, I mean, now you, if you say five and six, uh, if you beat the bad teams, now you go three and eight, or you fumble against a couple of the bad teams. And like, there's still a 48 win team. Yep. The Celtics, the Celtics are 36 and 24. And I would say any team that wins more than 45 games has had a good season, generally speaking. You know, if you're in that 46 to 50 range, once you cross 50, 50 is a good, 50 is a good year. You've won 50 games. That's a that's a magic number. Celtics are right there. After everything, they are right there. Will they get there? I don't know. But they're yeah. right there. And, I mean, I remember my preseason podcast where Jay, Jay King and Sam Packard and I do that stupid thing where we pick all the games. I think I was somewhere up there around a 48 to 50 win team. I forget what my, my total was. And during that whole 500 time, I was like, God damn it. I am just <laughs> going to look like such an idiot. But I can't believe I had so much faith in these guys. But here they are. They That one one big winning streak, boom, here they are. 100%, man. I, I thought, like, I, I was I was saying the same thing. I was high on this team, and then I, like, I, I gave up. I, I will fully admit that I gave up the ghost. Like, you know. But like they're twenty three and twenty five. I'm like, nope, screw this. I'm I was wrong. <laughs> the Wizards are in fact better. Shout out to Chris Grenham. I was I was wrong. But no, like no, I was I was right initially. I should always stick to my guns. Stick I'm always guns, right about man. everything. This is I'm filing this away for later that I will never ever pass <laughs> off anything ever again. I think the the ultimate lesson is first of all take things in context and see you know understand the why and then. Don't, you know, wait till the season's over. You just don't know how things are going to go. Right. The ultimate lesson here, and we don't know how the season's going to end, it could, they could, they could lose out for all we know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and be like, then we'll be sitting there and be like, oh my God, we're such morons for think, talking about 50 wins. But point is like, it's the NBA season. We're going to, we're going to have, we make this argument all the time, all the time. And people never seem to quite get it. And we always fall into the trap of immediacy. Because we do things every day. I do a podcast every effing day. And I write multiple pieces sometimes per day. And the immediacy of what's happening draws you in. And it's hard to, to pull back. But the lesson is the NBA season is long. It's a long season. And in the middle of it all, Look at these two teams that are playing tomorrow. One massive winning streak turns your season around, and suddenly you're like, wow, maybe that's their contender. And one massive losing streak takes the number one seed and has them, if people listen to the, the Roundtable podcast from a few days ago, host of Locked On Nets, Doug Nori, was like, I don't even think we make the playoffs at this point. So, I mean, the season is long, and you don't know – What's going to happen in the middle of it that sets your season right or or sinks it? Especially the season is especially long if you, if the team is hovering around five hundred. Yeah, because like that that's really important, right? Like if the Celtics were like six games below five hundred or something like that, this nine game winning streak, all of a sudden they're you know thirty one and they're still and middling, right? Something like that, right? Like so, it really, really, really mattered that they just hung in there enough because you can. You leave yourself all this wiggle room. You know, if you hang around 500, like you said, I mean, the Celtics went on a nine-game winning streak. That was really impressive. If you're if you're at 500, a five-game winning streak makes a huge difference in your entire mm -hmm. season. Because even if you, if you have a five-game winning streak and then you play 500 ball the rest of the way, 
you're a 48 win team. Like you're, you're right there. You know, like it's, it is, yeah, it, it is a long season and it is, it, it really just like even mediocrity is so much better than being a truly bad team. The Celtics managed mediocrity for a lot of the season and then they managed to be awesome for this last stretch. And now they have a chance to be a 50 win team. Like that's, you know, that's what it kind of comes down to. It's it, like you said, it is a very long season. This is, uh, I'm just trying to find the apt comparison. I'm going to compare it to George Foreman, Michael Moore, um, which for anybody who's not a boxing fan, you probably don't know it, but George Foreman at that point was old. Michael Moore was like this up and coming. He was a champion. Oh, yeah, that's that's a 9 11. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Foreman's just hanging in there, and then all of a sudden in the 10th round, boom, catches him with one and wins. It, and, until it's over, you just – it's you never know. And so, yeah, Celtics yep. Celtics have the potential. I, I just – stunning. Stunning that they have the potential for a fit, to be a 50-win team. We'll see how it goes. Obviously, I will be here tomorrow after the, uh, the, the post game. Tom, you'll be here next week for – some very variation of podcasts. We'll figure that out. But, Tom, thanks for uh, being here. We'll talk to you again next week. Thanks to everyone who subscribes to this daily podcast, Monday through Friday. It is free. It is available everywhere. If you're looking for Celtics content uh, on a regular basis, this is where you're going to find it. Follow me on Twitter at John underscore Corrales. Between this and my writing on Boston Sports Journal, I've got you covered. Uh, if you are a subscriber, if you are a, a viewer on YouTube, appreciate that. I would love it if you spread the word, share the podcast, tell everybody that they should be listening to and watching the Lockdown Celtics podcast here on the Lockdown Podcast Network.